this study has led me to update some of my opinions and beliefs. My opinions are really a derivative of the evidence. There was some early evidence suggesting that prebiotics may improve constipation. This study counters that and actually finds that prebiotics do not benefit constipation, whereas probiotics do. Hey everyone, welcome back. This is Dr. Michael Ruscio, DC. I am a practicing clinician, a clinical researcher, and an adjunct faculty at the University of Bridgeport. One of the things I do in my spare time is read all about probiotics and how this safe and efficacious tool can help us improve our gut health and then even reap some of these second order benefits outside of the intestines, like allergy, cognition, and the like. So today, I'm very eager to share with you a number of updates in this exciting world of probiotic research. We'll cover a number of studies ranging from women's health, children's health, gut health, and body composition. We'll touch on the impact of probiotics on vaginal health, PCOS, recovery from gynecological surgery, probiotics for kiddos, probiotics for gut health, including probiotics for SIBO. No, yes. And we'll also look at probiotics for constipation, probiotics for weight loss, probiotics for muscle recovery. And okay, let's jump in with probiotics and women's health. The first study aims to answer the question, do probiotics improve vaginal dysbiosis and related symptoms in women? Randomized control trial, 76 women with vaginal dysbiosis, a disruption in the flora, because remember, there is a vaginal microbiota, just like there's a gut microbiota and a skin microbiota as just a few examples. Given placebo or an oral probiotic, lactobacillus, after three months compared to the placebo group, those taking the probiotics had improved vaginal dysbiosis. But look at this. Even though there was improved vaginal dysbiosis, there was no difference in the symptoms, including discharge, burning, dysuria, and odor. This is an important thing to keep in mind in that, and I've said this so many times before, but I'm always looking to tie this in. We want to be careful not to treat the labs at the exclusion of the individual. So in this case, if this was in a doctor's office, the translation could be, well, Mary Sue, your labs look better. Yay. And Mary Sue goes, but I'm still having discharge, burning, uh, difficulty urinating, and odor, right? So the microbiota findings are interesting. I would say the most important thing, firstly, improvement of symptoms. We can then, I think, infer we will have a secondary benefit on the microbiota, but the microbiota may not be the most intelligent thing to target initially. And again, this matters so much because we see so many individuals who have had testing up the wazoo to no avail. So we want to be careful and bridled with how much testing we use, how much we treat the lab results, but rather this model we advocate for, keep using different therapies until you hit symptomatic improvement. Okay, next study. Do topical, so given as a suppository, probiotics improve genitourinary symptoms in pre- and postmenopausal women. Randomized control trial, so 70 women control versus a topical, um, you know, vaginal, um, sorry for my hand gestures there, uh, lactobacilli. And after one month, the suppository probiotic led to improved genital urinary symptoms in 70% of women, including dryness, odor, and incontinence. There was also an improvement in overactive bladder and a reduction in viral pathogenic bacteria. So good news for women. The next study kind of ties in hormones and metabolism as it pertains to PCOS and can probiotics and or symbiotics, symbiotics being a combination of probiotics with prebiotics, help. Now, this is a great data point. Meta-analysis, 17 randomized control trials in just over 1,000 patients. Again, control versus probiotic. The probiotic varied, and we try to include this so you can see, um, well, I guess, uh, like you see here, the probiotics varied from those including lactobacillus, those including bifidobacterium, 
those including soil based. So this would be very bacillus in the most uh, cases and also streptococcus. So again, 17 trials, different probiotics used. What they found was that probiotics, prebiotics, or symbiotics all led to improved fasting glucose, total, uh, total cholesterol, excuse me, triglycerides, LDL, CRP, and insulin. One of the points I want to keep bringing you and us back to is if we're seeing improvements with different types of probiotics used, we don't need to fall into the thinking that you need a specific probiotic for a specific condition. Because as you see in this summary of 17 control trials, different probiotics used all had favorable impact on glucose, cholesterol, triglycerides, inflammation, and insulin. Now, one more point here that I think is noteworthy. Using the probiotics for over three months was more effective than using the probiotics for less than three months. What this helps us to see is this emerging trend where a few months, maybe we could say three, is a threshold for which you should exceed the length of time you supplement with a probiotic. Why this matters, unfortunately, we'll see people who come into the clinic and they use the probiotic for a month and they'll say, it helped, but it didn't fix everything. So I wasn't sure if it was good enough and I stopped. Okay, I understand that. Having a time expectation is helpful. So in this case, and building on some other findings, a few months is probably better than just one. Checkpoint first is, is it helping yes or no? You should be able to answer that question after about a month, but then continue on and see where you level out, where you plateau. As this study depicts, more than three months of use was better than using for less than three months. And this next study wanted to answer the question that if you were gonna have a gynecological surgery, would probiotics improve your outcome? Thankfully, the answer here is yes. Now, they used placebo as compared to a soil-based probiotic. And they found there was a lower incidence of surgery-related adverse events and a faster intestinal recovery. So sometimes a surgeon may say, well, just to be on the safe side, avoid probiotics. That's understandable if one isn't familiar with the body of literature. You may want to follow up with your surgeon and say, is there any data you can point me to suggesting that if I'm going to go into this gynecological surgery, the probiotic would be counterproductive? And they may say, no, but I'm just making this recommendation out of an abundance of caution. Okay, well, show them this study. With this data on the table, would you still comment for me to avoid my probiotic, right? So these are things that you can discuss with your doctor. I just try to weave this in because sometimes conventional doctors revert to what I call the cautious negative. Well, I'm not sure, so to be safe, do nothing. Again, understandable. This is why as a health advocate, you have to sometimes bring research to your healthcare provider and also just do your own homework and make a decision that you're comfortable with. Again, checking with your doctor, but one data point to bring to him or her. Alrighty, probiotics and kiddos. Do healthy infants and toddlers benefit from probiotic supplementation? The answer here, yes. Let's unpack this study's results. A great data point, meta-analysis of 26 randomized control trials in nearly 4,000 children. Key point, these were healthy children. So it's one thing to say probiotics can help kids with diarrhea or what have you. Different to say, well, here's a healthy cohort of children. Will the probiotics help them? That's a higher bar to clear. What they found was probiotics improved colic, regurgitation or reflux, reduced the need for antibiotics, and reduced respiratory infection. So this is great news. And one of the reasons why I've been such an advocate for the use of probiotics in kids, zooming way out, let's say your child has reflux and regurgitation. You go to your PCP, your GI, whomever it is, right? And they say, well, let's put them on a PPI. Let's put them on an acid suppressing medication. 
Now, that's one option, but I would much, much rather someone use a probiotic first, give it a 30 day trial, reevaluate, and if this meta analysis is representative of what you would experience, which we would expect it to be, then you may see improvements in all of these markers. And as I'll show you uh, in another slide, other positive health impacts at the same time. And that's this next study. In this study, it was observational. So this is a less strong or, or, or less quality data point, but they found that a probiotic combined with a prebiotic improved allergy, nasal symptoms, and quality of life. So coming back to the kiddo with the regurgitation and the colic, they may also experience improvements in allergy. So really important to keep in mind, many things have a time and a place, but let's try to set them up in a semi-linear series of experiments with the most natural and safest therapies first, and then consider something like a PPI as kind of a last case resort. Alrighty, probiotics for gut health. This was a fantastic study. It often comes up in the realm of SIBO, this kind of canard that just won't go away. You shouldn't use probiotics if you have SIBO. This could not be further from the truth. Now, there are some cases in healthcare wherein we don't have ample data to answer a question. Fine. This is an area where we have more than ample data to answer the question. So we really have to update our thinking. And this is a seminal paper amongst a handful, a growing actually handful, two handfuls <laughs> that supports this. So this is a clinical trial, 48 SIBO patients with diarrheal IBS. They received either dietary advice or dietary advice plus Saccharomyces boulardii probiotic. After two weeks, only two weeks, what a short intervention period. The group receiving the addition of the probiotic experienced greater improvements in diarrhea, in IBS symptoms, and a greater improvement or reduction in their SIBO gas levels, leading to these two comments from the researchers. The safety of SB, Saccharomyces boulardii, was excellent. So there goes the, well, you, you, you can't use it if you have SIBO. These people had SIBO, they did great, and the researchers comment the safety was excellent. Continuing. Conclusion, in patients with SIBO, Saccharomyces boulardii, along with dietary advice, reduced bacterial overgrowth and improved digestive symptoms while restoring the intestinal microbiota. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better series of findings or comments for those with SIBO. So if you or someone you love has SIBO, please share this study with them because there's so much fear in some with SIBO. And interestingly, but uh, I guess it makes sense, there is a higher incidence of anxiety reported in those with IBS and in those with SIBO. So combine that baseline characteristic along with some of what you read on the internet is kind of doom and gloom fear mongery that probiotics should be avoided with SIBO. And you can see how people get very afraid of probiotics and can't just Take a deep breath, look at the evidence, and make an evidence-guided decision. All right, moving on. Do, or does, Saccharomyces boulardii reduce diarrhea in hospitalized COVID-19 patients? Clinical trial with 120 patients who had COVID and related pneumonia. They received an antibiotic alone or antibiotic plus, again, Saccharomyces boulardii. And look at this. The addition of the Saccharomyces boulardii led to a 64% reduction in diarrhea. That's excellent. And a shorter hospital stay. So even more evidence for the utility of probiotics. Here is another study, and this one was actually surprising to me. And this study has led me to update some of my opinions and beliefs, because as I hope you have started to appreciate, my opinions are really a derivative of the evidence. So there was some early evidence suggesting that prebiotics may improve constipation. 
This study counters that and actually finds that prebiotics do not benefit constipation, whereas probiotics do. Meta-analysis, so this is a great quality data point, summarizing 34 clinical trials in about 1,200 patients. Again, receiving control or a probiotic and, uh, or sorry, or receiving a symbiotic, meaning a probiotic plus prebiotic. So there's three options here in the multiple choice of treatment. Control, nothing, probiotic alone, or probiotic plus prebiotic. Now, what they found was that probiotics increase stool frequency, but symbiotics had no effect on frequency or on constipation. So it said really simply, probiotics alone improved constipation, probiotics with prebiotics, no impact on constipation. So what this tells us is we may wanna consider just probiotics for constipation. Now separate to this, there is good data finding that fiber, which does contain some prebiotic, is beneficial for constipation, but that's different than a prebiotic supplement, okay? So just an important delineation. The other thing to keep in mind, and if you're constipated, you may have learned this lesson already, fiber tends to be hit or miss with constipation. It will help some, it will flare others. Usually, the less symptomatic someone is, the higher the likelihood they will have a positive response to fiber. When taken in context with these findings from this study, I think we could say, coming back to the somewhat linear hierarchy, probiotics first, reevaluate. If you need more assistance, so to speak, then trial fiber. Doing so after the probiotic should improve the likelihood that you will see improved regularity and not have any sort of bloating or other adverse event. And then looking at probiotics and constipation in elderly, randomized control trial, 60 individuals, placebo versus probiotic. And after three months, they found probiotics led to a doubling in bowel movement frequency. So if you're going three times per week at baseline, you're now going six times per week. And here is a graph from the study with my note to be patient and Essentially, what you're seeing here is there's two lines for those who aren't looking at the visual. There's two lines. They're both going up and to the right. One line is the frequency of bowels in those on placebo. The other line is frequency of bowels in those taking the probiotic. The lines are touching each other. They're overlapping up until about 60 days, two months, and then whoop, the probiotic group starts to have a significantly better outcome regarding their bowel frequency. Lesson, be patient with a probiotic. I recommend at least a one month trial. This study suggests maybe you should wait two months. So I would say at least a month, maybe two, things to consider when evaluating the efficacy of a probiotic or evaluating if it's helping you Perhaps in elderly, it takes longer for these things to have their effect. I'm not really sure, but do with that what you will. Okay, final few studies here. Probiotics for weight loss and muscle mass. Do probiotics or symbiotics help with weight loss? Meta-analysis, 21 studies, 1,200 participants receiving diet and exercise or diet, exercise, and probiotic. Again, just as a side note here, the probiotics varied just to help you with, probiotics don't seem to be highly specific in terms of this formula for that condition or this strain for that symptom. Compared to control group, those with the addition of the probiotic had a better loss of weight and the best effect was actually seen in symbiotics, meaning probiotics plus prebiotics. So said simply, probiotics were helpful for weight loss. Probiotics plus prebiotics were better for weight or for fat loss. Why this may be 
is due to the fact that prebiotics slow down the absorption of glucose and they seem to have a glucose regulating effect. They tend to lower fasting blood glucose in those with elevations or higher than normal glucose levels. So this is probably why for weight loss in particular, we see that the addition of prebiotics on top of the probiotics probably makes sense. And another trial looking at probiotics or prebiotics in weight loss. They looked at 45 obese participants, giving them either a low carb and low calorie, a prebiotic or a probiotic. And what they found was all groups experienced a reduction in weight. And in this case, there wasn't much of a difference between all three groups. So said simply, change your diet that can improve your weight. Use a probiotic or a prebiotic that can also improve your weight. I should also mention, and as you can see here on the slide, the amount of weight loss is not huge. And that's crucially important to understand. These were obese participants. And the amount of weight loss from the probiotic or the prebiotic was three to four pounds. So that's something, but in an obese individual, it's not a, a really appreciable effect size. And then final couple of studies here. This one I found to be so fantastically interesting. Do probiotics improve muscle recovery? And the answer seems to be yes. This study, a randomized control trial in 114 healthy individuals looked at both live or heat killed probiotics, meaning researchers warmed them up, killed them. And they found that after six weeks, either living or heat killed probiotics improved muscle, muscle mass. And there's various uh, sort of metrics here of, of muscle, I should say recovery, strength recovery, decrease in physical fatigue, decrease in markers of skeletal muscle damage, and decreased inflammatory markers. So great study helping us to see that if you're an athlete or if you're someone who's maybe trying to start exercising, probiotics enhance your recovery. So great finding here. Now, within the realm of muscle mass comes up sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle mass. And you can see this in declining and ill populations. It's very important to preempt this because of the tight correlation between muscle mass, muscle strength, and all-cause mortality. And in this study, patients who had COVID and were losing muscle mass were given probiotics. And what you see is there were lower rates of sarcopenia or having a subpar level of muscle mass in those who took the probiotics. And there was also an increase in total skeletal muscle mass index. So even more data showing that whether you're exercising or using whey protein to try to up your protein intake for muscle mass or recovery, probiotics seem to synergize with muscle mass and muscle recovery. So definitely consider a probiotic if you are trying to optimize body comp, specifically your muscle mass and muscle strength. Okay, and that is it. So a number of studies on probiotics. And again, the one or two points I'd want to bring you back to. Testing oftentimes is not helpful for how to use these tools. Testing did not guide any of these trials, point one. Point two, various probiotics were used and they were all shown to be beneficial, which tells us there's no holy grail, there's no magic supplement. So you don't have to worry about this uber specific species or strain across multiple different trials with differing formulas, there seems to be benefit. So hopefully this helps simplify the landscape, allows you to use probiotics to improve your health and whether it be mood or vaginal dysbiosis or issues with children, again, helps you to improve your health. All right, guys, I'll talk to you next time.